Now, before we get into this one, it wouldn't be one of my videos without some classic merchandise or uh, clothing or maybe even something else. So I'm just gonna, this, this here is an original Benetton bag. I don't know how old this is, but like, an absolute classic. Anyway, let's get into it. To tell you about today's video is none other than Scuderia Ferrari driver Carlos Sainz. What are we looking at today, Carlos? Benetton. Thank you, Carlos. Benetton Formula Limited were a Formula One team that competed in our great sport from 1986 until 2001. Benetton entered 260 races. They won 27 of them, scored 102 points, won a Constructors' Championship, and two consecutive Drivers' Championships. This was a mega team, with quite the resume. Now, I don't want to bore you in this video, so we're going to break it down into three parts. We're going to start with the early days. Then we're going to have a look at the team's rise and Schumacher's championships. Then finally, we'll get into the fall. Benetton made their start in Formula 1 all the way back in 1983 as a sponsor for Tyrrell. They would sponsor Alfa Romeo in 1984 and 1985, and also Tolman in 1985. At the end of the 1985 season, Benetton Formula Limited was born. The group purchased Tolman Formula 1 team and made their start as a constructor. Tolman had developed the TG186 for the 1986 season. This was later renamed to the Benetton B186 after the purchase of the team. Benetton would change engine suppliers though, putting the old Hart engines in the bin and replacing them with BMW engines. Driven by Tio Fabi and Gerhard Berger, the B186 would prove to be a decent package throughout Benetton's first season. Gerhard would score the team's first podium finish in Imola and would start on the front row in Belgium. Tio Fabi would manage two pole positions in a row, one in Austria and then in Italy. Then, sweet sweet victory for Benetton after Gerhard Berger won in Mexico. Benetton's first season in Formula 1 wasn't really too bad, finishing 6th with 19 points. This was a massive improvement on Tolman's results the previous year, which, well, speak for themselves. 1987 would see further improvement, and though Gerhard Berger left the team to join Ferrari, Benetton would take advantage of Haas Lola, who would fold at the end of the 1986 season. See, BMW supplied three teams, but in 1987, they would only supply Brabham. Benetton took over Haas Lola's supplies of turbocharged Ford engines and used them in 1987. Benetton would have a little bit of trouble at the start of the season, but during the season, Benetton would reduce the effect of the turbo. This helped the team massively, making the unit much more reliable and a lot more consistent. The team ended the season 5th with 28 points. Now, let's get into part 2, the rise of Benetton. Now, for this part, I want to take you forward, all the way to the 1988 Australian Grand Prix. See, this is an important race. Many people there would have been there for their first time. One of those people attending for their very first race was none other than Italian businessman Flavio Briatore, a name that will always spark conversation between Formula 1 fans. Luciano Benetton approved Flavio as commercial director for the team, and in 1989, Flavio Briatore became the new Benetton Formula Limited team boss. At this point, it's a little bit strange to think that someone with no racing experience or general interest in the sport at all can become the boss of a Formula One team. But the decision to promote Flavio proved to be absolutely huge for the future of Benetton, as we'll soon find out. Flavio had a goal and that was to make Benetton into a competitive team. Mastermind and legend Ross Braun would also return to Formula 1 as Benetton's technical director. He is just another crucial person who forms part of Benetton's success story. So here we are in 1991, more specifically, the 1991 Belgian Grand Prix. This race might ring a bell for you, 
because this is the race where we were introduced to a guy called Michael Schumacher. Michael stepped in to replace Bertrand. Okay, I'm not, I'm, you know what? If I try, I'll get it wrong. So I'll just put it on the screen. Oh, what an idiot, man. Oh, oh. what's this? Get out, fucking useless. Rubbish, man. Anyway, who was actually in prison for road rage against a taxi driver and anyway, Mercedes would pay Jordan F1 team a sum of money for Michael's debut. Just a week before the race, Michael impressed Jordan designer Gary Anderson and team manager Trevor Foster at a test over at Silverstone. Michael would shine at Spa, qualifying 7th which was the team's best result all season. Though Michael would retire from the race with clutch problems, Jordan had seen enough, and so did another team, Benetton. Benetton were so impressed with what they saw from Michael that they secured a deal with him from that point onwards. This caused Jordan to protest the move. They even took the matter to court, but it all ruled in the favor of Benetton, as Michael and Jordan didn't have a contract. This is where things began to change. Benetton's future was on the up, and as we're about to find out, it wasn't without some controversy. 1992 and 1993 would be decent years for Michael. Though the year was dominated by Williams, in 92, Michael would get his first win at Spa. He finished the season third in the Drivers' Championship with 53 points. Then, in 1993, Williams would once again dominate the season. Michael took his only victory in Portugal, scored 9 podiums, and finished 4th with 52 points. But Benetton's new star driver was only getting warmed up. 1994 and 1995 were both massive years for Michael and the team. The Benetton B194 turned out to be incredible for Michael, winning 6 of the first 7 races. This was also the year that this happened, but uh, let's stay on track here, eh? There would be some bad moments for Michael though. After the British Grand Prix, Michael was disqualified for overtaking Damon Hill during the formation lap, and then ignoring black flags. He was handed a 2 race ban for his actions. This wouldn't be his only disqualification though. Michael Schumacher would finish first at the Belgian Grand Prix, but an illegal amount of wear had been found on the skid block of his car. Whilst Michael served his race bans, Benetton still tried to secure the Constructors' Championship. JJ Leto stepped in for Michael and the team replaced Jos Verstappen with Johnny Herbert, opting for more experience behind the wheel for the final two races. This plan didn't really work out for Benetton, as Herbert retired from both races, meaning Benetton lost the Constructors' Championship to Williams. In Australia, Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill's championship battle went down to the wire. On lap 36, Damon Hill was catching Michael. Then, Michael went off at the East Terrace corner, which caused him to slightly hit the wall with his wheels. He managed to get back on the track. Schumacher then pulled across the track ahead of Hill, and when Hill went for a move down the inside, Michael had turned in. The two collided, and suddenly Michael found himself in the wall. Initially, all looked good for Damon Hill, but his front left soon showed signs of damage. The front left suspension wishbone could not be fixed. Both drivers didn't finish the race, meaning no points were scored for either driver. This made Michael Schumacher the 1994 Formula 1 World Champion. But wait a minute. I think I forgot something. Ah yes, cheating. I forgot about that. Okay. Oh, well. No, it's none of your concern. So this gets pretty deep and there is no possible way I can explain this in under 10 minutes, okay? So if you want to know the full story about this crazy controversy from 1994, I suggest you look at Aiden Millward's video. He covers it incredibly well. I'll link that in the description below because there's so much to it. Basically, the FIA discovered something a little bit suspicious. A quote, start sequence or launch control software in the Benetton B194. But as I said, it gets deep. Like, also there's some fuel valves without fuel filters. But anyway, let's, let's, let's just keep going, okay? In 1995, Benetton would switch to Renault V10 engines. Johnny Herbert was set to partner world champ Michael Schumacher for the season. Early on, Michael had some issues with the car, admitting that it was hard to control. Michael would crash out from pole in Imola, and after that, changes were made to the car which would see performance improve. Michael would pretty much dominate for the rest of the year, 9 wins from 17 races, and a second world title. Johnny Herbert would score a podium in Spain and win the British and Italian Grand Prix. 
Benetton would win the Constructors' Championship in that year of 1995. Now, let's get into part 3, the beginning of the end and the real fall of Benetton. The 1996 season would be the beginning of the end for Benetton. A team at such height were about to begin their fall. In 1996, Michael Schumacher departed from the team early, despite being contracted. Michael joined Ferrari for the 1996 season after two championships with Benetton. The team star driver had left and Johnny Herbert had been dropped. Benetton hired John Alesi and Gerhard Berger, both former Ferrari drivers. During the 1996 season, Williams would dominate. Ferrari would fight for race wins with the Schumacher firepower that they had acquired. Benetton did manage 10 podiums, but they didn't win a race for the first time since 1988. Benetton would finish the season third with 68 points. When 1997 came around, Ross Braun and Rory Byrne decided to depart Benetton and jump on board the Ferrari train, joining Michael Schumacher. Benetton would still manage third in the Constructors' Championship with 67 points. Gerhard Berger would even win the German Grand Prix, but little did they know, this would be Benetton's final win in Formula 1. 1998 would see more change. Berger retires, Alesi leaves, Alexander Wurz gets a full-time drive alongside Giancarlo Fisichella, and of course, Renault decided to pull out of Formula 1. This meant that Benetton were forced to use Renault's previous 1997 engines, which were acquired by Mechachrome, a precision engineering company. These engines would later be rebadged as Playlife, a sportswear brand owned by Benetton. Then, Flavio Briatore was replaced by Dave Richards, the boss of ProDrive. 1998 was a total write-off. Well, besides the two consecutive podiums in Monaco and Canada, and, well, also a pole in Austria. But the reality was that Benetton were not what they used to be. Benetton finished the season fifth with 33 points. It wouldn't be long before Dave Richards departed from Benetton. After one year, old mate had had enough. Rocco Benetton took over the role. Meanwhile, Flavio Briatore was leading Supertech. In 1999, Supertech supplied Benetton with engines which were badged as Playlife. The Benetton B199 was underwhelming to say the least. Giancarlo Fisichella managed P2 in Canada, but only 10 cars finished that race. But hey, you know, a podium's a podium, so, you know, hats off to you, Fizzy. In March 2000, Renault bought out Benetton for $120 million. Renault would become the latest manufacturer to compete in the biggest and best racing category in the world. A statement from Luciano Benetton read, Today's globalization means that it must be the specialists in each sector who compete in their own market. We have invested a great deal in Formula 1, and it has brought us more satisfaction than we could have imagined. Now, to guarantee the development the team deserves in this new scenario, it is appropriate to pass the baton to Renault. I take this opportunity to thank all the sponsors who have supported us with the passion in this extraordinary adventure. Renault now owned the team, but for the time being, they would still compete under the name Benetton. Renault rehired Flavio Briatore and began to restructure the team for Renault's future. The Benetton B200 managed three podiums, all scored by Giancarlo Fisichella. Alexander Wurz had a season to forget with only the one single point finish. This would see Alexander drop for the 2001 season, replaced by Jensen Button. In 2001, only a single point was scored in the first 11 races, but at the German Grand Prix, Fisichella and Button would finish fourth and fifth. The car got better later in the season, and Fisichella would even score a podium in Belgium. Even though Benetton would end their final year in Formula 1 with 10 points and 7th in the Constructors' standings, that final podium was a somewhat wholesome end for a team that was once a massive powerhouse in Formula 1. Benetton is one of my all-time favourite Formula 1 teams. It's a team that was pretty much immortalised by Michael Schumacher. He won 19 out of the team's 27 race victories. When Michael left, it really was the beginning of the end for Benetton. I often think of it as a ripple effect. The truth is, Benetton reached the top. 27 wins, 102 podiums, 15 pole positions, 36 fastest laps, one constructors title, and two world championships. When the team's decline became too far gone, it wasn't logical or feasible to continue anymore. Benetton Formula Limited was a product of its time and a really great, successful one. When the opportunity arose to pass the baton to a company that wanted to prove its worth among some of the biggest manufacturers in the world, it was just the right thing to do. 
Benetton may have taken their vibrant, eye-catching colours with them, but what they have left is a legacy that will remain in Formula One history forever. Alright, thank you all so much for watching this video. This was highly requested by a lot of you, so I finally got around to doing it. This is one of my favourite teams of all time. Just so much history, such a cool team, like, I just I just love Benetton, so this was really enjoyable to make. Um, if you enjoyed it, make sure that you subscribe and hit the notification bell, because YouTube has been playing some games with my channel lately, and not many people have been getting uh, notifications or seeing my post show up, which is weird. I've been getting a lot of messages from you guys. But main thing is, is that I'm having fun. We're all having fun. That's what it's all about. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.